The Holy Spirit has anointed that name, hasn't he? Amen. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There's so much behind that name. You know, our whole salvation is wrapped up in that name. It ain't about a religion, a denomination, or creeds and stuff. It's about a person. Amen? And his name is Jesus. And I hope you know him today. I hope your faith is in him because he's the only way to heaven. And uh, there's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Amen? Amen. I want to read from 1 Corinthians. It is on the Lord Jesus from which the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. The The old word for lamb, the Pascal lamb, and that word Pascal means the passion or the sufferings of Christ. And Jesus was the, a lamb that was violently slain, horribly crucified on an old rugged cross. But it's on that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the dove, descended. And I want to tell you this morning, church, we'll have the presence and power of God on our lives in a greater way uh, the more that we are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and become lamb-like in our own lives. You know, Noah, after the flood, sent out two birds. He sent out a raven, and and then he sent out a dove. And the raven never came back because the raven has a disgusting nature that fed and feasted off the dead carcasses floating on the waters. And he was fully satisfied out there on that nasty dead flesh. But the dove, Noah sent out, and the dove came back. There was no land, and the dove surely wasn't going to land his feet on dead, death carcasses and flesh. And I want to tell you, there's a message in that for us today. The Holy Spirit descended on the Lord Jesus. Without measure, the Bible says. And I want to tell you this morning, uh, God wants us to walk in the Spirit. And in his power, I need power today, amen. I need power over temptation. I need power to deal with my weaknesses and my doubts and frailties and all the stuff that I'm made of. I need power to be bold, a bolder witness for Jesus. Uh, I need all kinds of Holy Ghost power on my life today, church. And never more am I realizing today how much the church is in a desperate strait for an outpouring of the blessed Holy Spirit of the living God. But I learned something about the Holy Spirit that he, he's gentle, he's dove-like, he's tender, he's a holy spirit. And I'm telling you, he is not descending on the body of Christ today because we have too much flesh, too much stuff in our lives. But I want to tell you today, if we'll just really, really get hungry for God, the Holy Ghost will take us and set us free and use us for his glory. Amen. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The whole argument starts at verse 18, goes through chapter 2, verse 5. That chapter division is just not um, a very good one at this uh, place. Men added those later on, but Paul's argument begins this way. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish is foolishness. That word is where we get our word moron. We make fun of people with that word, but people who are dying without Christ consider what we're doing today with these symbols before us of a, of a little piece of bread that can be crushed real easy and a cup of blood. They're symbols of weakness. They are symbols of death. They are symbols of uh, humanity. And there's nothing. Look at this table. We've got them dressed up in some silver stuff. 
but there's really nothing about these symbols that just looks like power or royalty or awesomeness. Uh, you know what I'm saying? The things that we see today, celebrityism and, and fancy things, there's just absolutely nothing fancy about these. And I don't know how. I mean, I just absolutely, for the life of me, can't understand how these two symbols could be the essence of our Christianity. I mean, there's just, come on, now I'm being just a little tinge sarcastic this morning because in all honesty, how? I don't get it. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things that we believe that just don't make any sense whatsoever. And I cannot figure out for the life of me how that pitiful looking helpless worm of a man who says he's the king of kings and lord of lords says he's the son of god that he made the worlds look at him there he is on that old cross uh, so helpless uh, so pitiful looking do you actually think that he could save a person from their sins look at him they mocked him didn't they hey you're, if you are who you say you are, show us, big boy. Come on down off of that cross and show us. And they mocked him. Here's the king. And they beat him and scourged him and put the robe and the, the crown of thorns. They were mocking the Son of God. And you know what? That's the same attitude the world has today toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm serious. Hey, you know, church, can we just be honest today? This world don't take us serious. What kind of influence does Christianity have in the world today? We don't have any kind of influence. We got church members voting for people that are for killing babies. Uh, that comes out of the church. Uh, I mean, that's one example of a multitude of things. So let's be honest today. We're really not making a big den in this whole world. Now, we love Jesus, and we few people and others across the globe gather together, and we have a church service, uh, but many of us have sons and daughters that care nothing about Christ. I mean, Jesus ain't on their priority list, nor his word, nor his people, nor, nor his sacred holy ordinances. It don't mean anything to them. And we as Christians, we, come on now, I'm putting we in this, and I'm, I'm leading us up. I just want us to be frank. Okay? I, I just want us to be frank with one another because until we get to the place of realization that we are actually powerless in influencing so many, maybe then we will begin at some point to fall on our faces and say, God, i got a son who's going to hell and he don't even know it. Lord, wake him up. That might will change us when we realize that we're not making a difference in this world. And I want to tell you, I don't have to preach to you this morning. I'll preach to me because I don't have what I preach. I don't even know if I believe it. Brother Bobby, you know, the Bible says that when God told Noah he's going to destroy the world with a flood, the Bible says, by faith, he moved with fear. He believed God so much that he shook in his shoes that his world would be destroyed. He took God serious and spent the rest of his life committed to the cause of Christ and took the ridicule and took the shame and took it all to do the will of God. And he saved his house. He saved his sons and his daughter-in-laws and his wife. And what a great man of God. In our estimation today, the way you measure Christianity Noah was the biggest failure in religious ministry. Yeah. 
David 120 years. And his church numbered eight people. Because God don't measure his kingdom by heads. God is a quality God. Now, friend, I'm going to tell you, if I really believe like Noah did, I couldn't remain the same. God told me in his word like he told Noah that my nephews and nieces and siblings and spouses and cousins and fellow employees, God told me in his word that they will spend an eternity in a claustrophobic, dark, hot place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth for eternity. Do I believe that? Do I really believe that? Then how can I sit so unmoved? How can I do things normal? How can I just continue doing things and hoping everything will come out in the wash and everything will work? That's where Paul was. And I want to show you that. Holy Ghost challenge us this morning. The preaching of the cross to those who are perishing. It's absurd and silly. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. It is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, God says, and I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. God says, where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? After the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. So it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. Now, he's not talking about me getting up here and preachers getting behind pulpits and what we're doing and the style and all that. He's talking about the message that we preach, the message of the cross. The Jews are always looking for a sign. The Greeks, they're always seeking after more wisdom. But we preach Christ, Christ crucified. To the Jews, that's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. But unto them which are called out of the Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God, no, he didn't just say that. God is not weak. God is strong. He's El Shaddai, the Almighty. The weakness of God is stronger than men. He is saying God's not weak, but he looked weak on the cross. God manifested in the flesh. The Jews said, no way, Jose. That is not our man. That is not our Messiah. We want a king. We want a guy that's going to come and destroy Rome. We want a guy coming in power and glory, and he's going to demolish the bad guys, and he's going to set up a big throne in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign in our midst. And this guy on a cross, no way. And 2,000 years later, millions of his own people still deny that he's come and that he died and that he rose again. Such a tragedy of blindness and the Greeks where Corinth was and all of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and all these guys you learned about in school but you never learned about Paul 
And these guys would come to the churches and places in the streets and the square corner, and they would stand, and people would be gathered around, and they had long words and eloquent words, and people would be going, wow, I don't know what he said, but he's very smart and very intellectual. He's been to the seminary. He's an educated man. And oh, they would sit in awe, but they would sit unchanged, unstirred, unsaved, because men, as smart as they are, as religious as they are, as rich as they are, have no power. God has power. That's why we preach Christ. We sing Christ. We love Christ because Jesus has done for me what no man could do for me. He stepped into my world and he took my black heart. He washed it in his red blood and he made it whiter than snow. He pulled me up out of the miry clay, set my feet on a solid rock, and he's established my goings. He blessed me with a darling wife. He blessed me with darling children and darling grandchildren. He's saving my family. He called me to preach his gospel. He filled me with a Holy Ghost and I praise him today. Dad, man can't do it. Man can't give it to us. But oh, if I can get my hands on so and so study Bible, I'll be a dynamite Christian. No, you just need to get the plain Word of God out and open up on your knees before the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I want something man can't give me. I want to hear from heaven. That's why some of you and me have no power. We sleep during the sermon. We don't even want to come and sing. We have no worship. Oh, I'm sounding mean today. You're going to cut my pay. I wish you would. I wish somebody would come down hard on me. But I want to tell you, the devil wants me to shut up. He wants me to back off. But I can't but preach, friends. We don't have the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on. Let me read on and I'll prove what I'm saying. Are y'all with me? Boy. Here's where you come in and this is beautiful. Verse 26, do you see your calling, brothers and sisters? Not many wise people. God didn't call mighty people. Or noble, royal people. Look at the followers of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But God's chosen the foolish to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak to confound the things that are mighty. Base things. Things that are despised. God has chosen. Why? So that you and me wouldn't strut and brag about how spiritual we are and how much God needs us. Then he'd get all the glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Of him are you in Christ Jesus who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, according it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The only boasting we should be doing is Jesus. For by grace are you saved. Unmerited favor through faith, not of works. Why? Not of works. Because you would have bragging rights. And you would boast. And let me tell you, a spirit of boastfulness is totally opposite of the spirit of the Lamb. Look at this poured out blood and this broken body. Tell me what arrogance you see in that. If I were God, I'd want to show myself off. Yes, I would. I'd want to show how big I am. I'm God. But God wants to show himself off. He becomes not a man, but a slave. He was sold for a slave's price. Poured out his blood. What glory is there in that? 
Huh? We don't like it. You ever see anybody wearing jewelry of a cross? It's got blood on it? Lord, no. Nobody would be attracted to that. Because what's attractive about a a man on a cross, bruised, black, beaten, and bloody, acting like he's God and can save people? There's no glory in that. And we try to artificialize Christianity because we don't want this world to look down on us and we don't want to be embarrassed. You know, therefore we choose the gold cup, not the old wooden cup. You know, our grandparents and their grandparents would travel over on old dusty wagons and bless God from time to time they'd stop in an open field and some brothers and sisters would get together and they'd pray and they'd say, our kids are growing up. We need to, we need to, we need to have some meetings and they'd find an old stump to get up on and preach. They'd hew a little tree and make a bench for sinners to come and weep and because they knew the Holy Ghost had the power of conviction. And they'd stand out there in the field and they'd just preach the gospel. Unlearned men, many of them unlearned and uneducated but full of the Holy Ghost. And they'd preach the gospel and, and they would see the Holy Ghost move in revival. And they came and in their humility, mounting up as much money as they possibly could, putting together an old log house uh, with dusty floors uh, and old wooden benches uh, and no air condition and no heat. Uh, but there they would Assemble together in their humbleness. Nothing fancy like we have here. No monitors and no stuff that we have. Because they did what they could. Because they were very humble people. And they wasn't trying to outshow the other church down the road. All they wanted is was for the Lord to be present. And the Holy Ghost to show up. And their kids and grandkids come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And yeah, buddy, you better believe it. They would rear back and preach the gospel. And they would preach hellfire and brimstone. Why would they preach hellfire and brimstone? Because they believed God when he said there's a place called hell. And they didn't want their loved ones going. But somewhere in America, we got money. The wars kept us humble. And people would gather the house of God and pray for their husbands and sons that they might come home alive. And they were humble, humble people. But America got obese. She got prosperous. She got gold and silver and TBN is on owner. And now we're in a spirit of competition. Who can have the most of this and that? And you know what? We've sacrificed the power, Sister Becky. We've compromise the Holy Ghost because you know what I'm preaching this morning church I love you with all my heart but I want you to get on this with me this morning we have succumbed and I said let's be frank and I'll preach to Bobby Wood I want to tell you friend I've got to see people saved I've got to experience the Holy Ghost I'm about to die I can't sleep I'm miserable Ask my wife. I can't function because I know millions are going to hell and I need to set up a rescue station. And I'm telling you, God, take us. And I hope you're with me. Lord, burn us out. Help me pay the price. Help me travail in prayer. Some of us, listen to our prayer requests. Would you heal so-and-so? And And would you heal our so-and-so? And heal so-and-so? Nobody's getting up and saying, my son and my daughter is in the grip of the devil. Help me pray, church. We've lost the Holy Ghost. You know what? I won't tell you. Daphne and I met a mother for lunch. And her son was united with the devil. His life was a mess. And she looked at us. 
in our conversation and she said, she said, I know I've got to pray him out of this. And then she said, I just, I need to get closer to the Lord. And I startled her. I said, you don't want to do that. Trust me. And she looked at me so funny and so strange. Because don't we all want to get closer to the Lord? Can I take this thing off today? I'm not going to preach long. And I said, you don't want to get close to the Lord. I said, because... He'll crush you. He'll put in you what he had on the cross. And you'll travail. And you'll have pains. And you might not sleep. And some days may be long because you'll start to ache. Because you see, now there may be, I don't know, I'm, I'm a man, M-A-N-M-A-L-E, Bobby with a Y, not an I-E, I'm a man. Very few women, the way I understand, have children without pain. Man. At least one. <laughs> Am I right, ladies? It hasn't changed. God's method spiritually hasn't changed. And I'm going to tell you this morning, hallelujah, Holy Spirit. Uh, I got to finish here. Now, the word an in verse 2 or verse 1 of chapter 2, y'all know the word an is a continuation of what you're reading. And so Paul says, I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Now, folks, look at me. This is a man who studied in Rome and Tarsus. He knew Greek. He knew Hebrew. He knew he had been to the third heavens and brought back 13 books of the New Testament. Nobody had more knowledge than Paul. But he says, when I come to you, I did not come as a man who knew it all. Which can be a curse on me and thee. And I'll tell you why when I read on down. I determine not to know anything among you except one thing. Jesus, the Christ, and Him crucified. You, you brothers and sisters, you have no idea of how, I mean, everywhere is philosophers, brilliant men. And this guy shows up, and Paul was a short man. He was a short man. When you saw him, there would be like nothing that would be attractive about Paul. Nothing. And then he shows up with this moronic sermon telling a city, a city who was famous for its temples. It was famous for the, uh, the temple of healing. And Paul shows up because he had been to the third heaven and God had to give him a bodily infirmity to keep him humble. And here he shows up with a body, a bodily infirmity in a, in a town that's 
praise for its temple of healing. He shows up in a city that has the most famous temple, the temple of Aphrodite, that had over a thousand male and female prostitutes. Thousands of people went to the temple. It's where they got their religion. It's where they sustained their religion. And they loved homosexuality. They love lesbianism. They loved it all. In America, we're in shock. Yeah. <laughs> Corinth, it was every day. And Paul struts into that place. And he says, I know a man. Named Jesus who died on a cross. He's your way to heaven. He wants you to turn from your sin and put your faith in Him. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. You're crazy, man. That's all you've got? No. No. There was something with him you couldn't see. Yeah. I was with you in weakness and fear. I was shaking. My speech and preaching was not like you 21st century preachers that have fine words and fine illustrations and you persuasive words. Circle this in your Bible. But in demonstration of the Spirit, the Spirit of power, that your faith would not stand in men, but in God's power. Yeah. <laughs> there was something with this little fella you couldn't see. You couldn't put your hand on it. It was the Spirit of the living God. Yeah. And while Paul was preaching to men's ears, the Holy Ghost was piercing their heart. Oh, yeah. And the Holy Ghost was showing them how vile they were, how sinful they were, how depraved they were. He, they loved their lifestyle and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost has entered into their hearts with conviction and power and they are seeing their life is misery and empty and they saw themselves headed to a devil's hell. But folks, the gospel just doesn't show you your sin. It shows you the Savior. And they were like now under great conviction. Tears were rolling. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul preached the cross, lifted up the Lord Jesus, look unto Him and be ye saved. And the Holy Ghost wrought faith. And some of them believed in the Lord Jesus. And the Holy Ghost came in and they got free. And they began to hate drunkenness. They began to hate homosexuality. They began to hate lesbianism. They began begin to hate adultery and sleeping in bed in fornication. They begin to hate gambling and a cursed tongue. I could go on and on and on and get every one of us because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God and the Holy Ghost came in and buddy they got free. They got joy and peace and assurance that they were saved by the glory of God. Now new life I can't do that. No. And it ain't happening. Where do you see? I'm not talking about fake stuff. 
I'm not talking about hyped up stuff. I'm not talking about stage fire and strange fire. Does anybody know? Has anybody heard? Has anybody seen where the Holy Ghost is demonstrating himself in power and in glory and drunkards and all kinds of sinners, people full of hate, people full of anger, people that won't reconcile, people that steal. Where do you see any Body, giving up their sin, falling on their face and say, oh God, I'm not right. Where do you see the husband who should love his wife, vice versa, getting on their knees and saying, Holy Ghost, fix our marriage. Fix us, oh Lord. Where do you see saints, saints they call themselves on Facebook that use four-letter words and run down everybody you're in a cesspool of hell and friend I'm going to tell you this morning only the Holy Ghost can bring us out I know it ain't revival but I'm in revival and I'm telling you new life I'm not telling you as your brother I am begging you to seek the Father for more of His Spirit. Yeah. We can't meet culture as we are. And I have a choice. God has brought me to Kadesh. I'm miserable. Do I calm down, back off? Stay here for 10 years, feed the sheep, and get paid, and have a nice little cozy retirement place. You all wouldn't fire me. I know you wouldn't. I could get dry and dead as four o'clock. Then you would get dry and dead as four o'clock. And we would all be dead and dry and we would be in unity because every cemetery people get along. We can sail on to heaven, never see any of our family, friends, enter a church anywhere and get all fixed up by God. And we could just sail on hoping everything's just going to work itself out. Or I can get my sanity back, you know, just be cool. I'm probably really taking this stuff too serious anyway. Or we can say, Brother Tim, I don't believe God's done. I don't believe the Lord has lost any power. He ain't on vacation. He ain't tired. He's not frustrated. He's not just pacing heaven's floor with the corruption that he sees and the voices of 50 million babies, innocent blood, ringing in his ears. He still love. He delights in mercy. Yes, he, does. he loves to bestow amazing grace. Yeah. But he keeps telling me and he keeps telling you there's so much I can do and will do and want to do. But I just need some vessels. I just oh, need God. some people that's available. I need some hands and some feet. And God says, above all things, before I start anywhere else, I need some worshipers. I need some people that are willing to say, Father, grant me the travail of the cross. Help me to have a praying spirit. And friend, God is just looking. He's just walking to and fro, just wanting somebody's availability. Who will say, Holy Spirit, 
Take me, use me. I want people to get saved through my overflowing life. And church, you all have been so patient this morning. I mean, I didn't even know what I was going to preach. I knew I had a text. I didn't know how I was going to preach it. But God has given me tremendous liberty to preach it. But I'm going to tell you, new life, I love you all so much. To let a man of God release the burden God has put on him like this is a great big thing to me. But I know in this small crowd here, I have those of you who really, really, really love Jesus with all your heart. And you've got loved ones, you've got neighbors, you've got friends. And you know what? You know what? I don't care if God does anything at New Life in a majestic way. I just want to pray so God starts a fire somewhere. I don't care what church is it in. Nine times out of ten, Jim, it ain't going to be in the big fancy stuff because God chooses the weak and the foolish and the unexpected. I just want to get to the place where I'm a Holy Ghost man. I'm sold out to the Lord Jesus. He gave His all for me and I want to give my all for Him. God, preach me. Use me for Your glory or take me home. I'd love to be with the Lord. Get up there and see Jesus and kiss Him and sit in His lap and love at His feet and worship Him. But you know why? I got to roll up my sleeves. I got to get my hands dirty. We'll work till Jesus comes, the song says. But church, listen to me. We've got to get the Holy Ghost in this place. In our lives. And the, the legacy that our Lord left us through His broken body and His shed blood. The legacy He left us is the treasure of His Spirit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm looking at people right now, as I close, who are, who, who, it's okay with you. You're sitting here and you know that you know that Jesus Christ has washed you in His blood, sanctified you by His Spirit, and He's done a number on your life. Friend, thank God for that. But don't be selfish. Yeah. Don't hoard it up. Let God have you. Yeah. And don't ask this preacher. Don't ask me nothing. How to get it, how to have it. What's going to happen? No. You know what? You know what, Terry? We've, we've done many people wrong by saying, now, here's how I got saved, and this is how you get saved. Well, you may have shouted. This person may just sat there and cry. I mean, come on. And you know what? I'm not going to formulize God. But I will tell you this. I had a lady in my church. Not this church. In my church that I was pastoring, there was, a, there was a, a singing group. And they would go everywhere and sing. And this is not y'all at Core Hill either, okay? So. And these, these, these people were well known. Um, so this lady in the church, who's an extremely humble lady, the only people that knew her was their neighbors in the church. And she called me and she'd say, Brother Bobby, I, I want to sing for the Lord, but I just can't sing like those people. And, and for, for years, she wouldn't sing. So I got to preaching on the Holy Ghost. You get filled with the Holy Ghost and he'll do this and he'll do that. And, and the Holy Ghost, she called me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. This humble lady called me one night. And I answered, and she said, I got it. 
I said, I mean, the tears you could hear over the other side of the phone. I mean, she was full. And I mean, the Spirit of God, I felt him all through that phone line. And she said, I mean, I can't remember what else she said. I just heard her say, Brother Bobby, I got it, and I'm going to sing for the Lord. And she got up one Sunday morning. And let me tell you something. It was not an angelic voice. But there was not a dry eye in the house because the Holy Ghost was on her. I don't want to do anything else without him. I wish I could have a conference to all of my preacher brethren and let's burn our notes. And let's quit thinking how arrogant we are that we can change everybody by our fancy sermons and seek the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bow your heads. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Church, love your Jesus right now. Just love on the Lord. You don't have to see him. Do you love him? Has he been good to you? Has he touched you and saved you? He's going to take you to heaven. Does he walk with you in those hospital rooms, in the surgery room? Has he been with you when your children have broke your hearts and people that, that you loved has hurt you? Has Jesus been there to embrace you? He's never left you. He's never left you. We've grieved him. Oh, church, this morning, let's come clean with a Holy Ghost. Those judgmental words, that tongue set on the fire of hell, that critical spirit of condemning other people, those hateful words and gossiping words, those backstabbing words, those mean words and cruel words. He has to clean up our tongues. He has to sanctify. What about our imaginations? Our imaginations are are, uh, hells in our head. Our imagination can be vile. It can be violent and think the grossest thoughts. And you realize the depravity of your imagination. You see yourself on the stage or you see yourself in some celebrity place or you envision pornography in your mind. And I could go on and on and on. Our imaginations need to be cleansed by the Holy Ghost. That person that we hurt, that thing we stole, maybe we need to make restitution. Maybe we need to say, I'm sorry. Just let the Holy Ghost have His way. Because I'm going to tell you, when we get honest with God, and that's it, church, nothing fancy, nothing fancy. Just get honest with our Father He will pour out so much of Himself on us. We will come into this building and we will know He's here.